Okay. Well, what I'm going to do tonight is present some uh, basic overview concepts that I have learned from observing communities and researching them, interviewing people that live in communities, that have founded communities. And I've done this for about 20 years and have written a couple of books and many magazine articles and I teach workshops on this and speak at conferences. Used to be just in the U.S., but now it's internationally. And my books have been translated into some other languages, which is why they even know about me in Europe. And so um, when uh, the Belfast housing folks asked me to do this, I was happy to because I already know them from six years ago when I was there. And so I'd like to introduce a concept that I have on this little chart here. I hope you can see this. It's not exactly great art, but it'll do. And I'm wondering if you have pencil and paper with you, wherever you might be sitting at your computer, if you'd be willing to draw a circle like this with three lines, baking it into thirds. So what I have is a one, a two, and a three. And there are three basic aspects of community that I think are really, really, really important. And it's sort of helpful when considering how a community functions to think about these things. So the second one is community glue. And you know what that is. That's when everybody is having a good time doing things with each other, enjoyable activities, shared meals, work parties, singing together, sing-alongs, dancing together, folk dances, contra dances, square dances, dances of universal peace, rock and roll dances, every kind of dances, uh, singing and dancing together, telling stories, storytelling evenings around the campfire, storytelling evenings, not in the evening, no campfire, just telling stories, um, sharing important experiences together bonds and connects a group and helps us feel that community feeling and most people when they think about how they're going to be in a community this is what they think about they think we need to do these things so i'm going to very briefly talk about the neurotransmitter oxytocin turns out that when people do certain kinds of things with other people enjoyable activities like the ones we've just named oh did i say playing sports you know volleyball and Frisbee and pool and billiards and checkers and chess and poker and any kind of games, when people play them together, that also tends to be enjoyable and helps do this thing to create community glue. Oxytocin is a neurotransmitter that helps people feel happy and bonded and connected to the other people that they're, con that they're in the same presence of when it's coming out of the brain and it goes through the bloodstream, and it uh, is created in the presence of enjoyable activities with others, which creates a sense of trust with the other people and creates a sense of gratitude. And so oxytocin, which is produced in the brain and all throughout the body, lasts for just a few minutes, and then it gets used up. So if it's continually being produced, it's because a person is in a situation of trust with other people and a situation of gratitude one or the other or both, which is what enjoyable community activities creates. Why this is important is because it helps the group have such a sense of we're, we're us, we're something bigger than just me, we're a group and we have this kind of cultural identity with the community. And when we do that, it means that when we have conflict and difficulties and differences of opinion about important matters that we have to decide together, it's easier for us because we've got this shared history of shared culture, community glue, a sense of us. So that's a really important part, and I have it as number two here on the list. Number three, I'm going to call a good process and communication skills. Pardon my handwriting. Good processing communication skills, meaning we know how to do group process when we have to talk about something, if we have a conflict or we have an issue or we have something big and scary or small and annoying that happened and we need to talk about it. We know how to do that. We've been trained in how to do that. We're good in doing that. It takes learning how to do this. People who first join a community or who first start a community aren't necessarily good at this yet but we need to get good at it because it's like one of the basic skills of living in community 
the two things that I highly, highly, highly recommend for groups to learn is the nonviolent communication process, sometimes called NBC, and restorative circles, which is a conflict resolution and restoration process. Um, restorative circles comes from NBC. It's derived from it. NBC can be learned and practiced unilaterally. The whole group does not have to learn it or practice it for it to create a kind of a meme that goes through the community and helps the group. I live in a community. It's not co-housing. It's called Earth Haven Eco Village in North Carolina. We had a series of six week study groups on NBC that were voluntary and uh, people would just go and learn if they wanted to. And the meme or the information or the method of using NBC has spread through the community. And we're now talking to each other with more kindness and goodwill and um, good heart than we used to do because we'd been influenced by this. The third one, which I've saved for last because it's not the most obvious, but it's super important, is effective project management. And you might think, well, why do we need that? We're a community, not some business. So let me write that down. So here's the three things. Effective project management is the first one I put. Creating community glue is the second one. And the third one, the third important factor for a good community to function well, in my opinion, is good process and communication skills. So what is effective project management? Uh, any kind of intentional community, including a co-housing community, needs to ongoingly manage it, manage itself. That is to say, budgets, strategic plans, cash flow projections. What are our agreements? Where are they located? How can any of us find them at any time? Do we need to hire somebody to do a particular task or job for us? Do we need to hire one of our own selves? Or do we need to get a volunteer from within our own group to do a particular task or job or project that needs doing? How can we help maintain our buildings, keep our bank account healthy and in the black, and understand what agreements we're making? Um, do we need to get a loan? How can we? Can we pay it back? What are the terms? Do we need to hire somebody to do some kind of something? Anyway. This does not stop on the day of move-in. It continues throughout the life of the community, co-housing community, any kind of community. Very often people who live in a community don't know that good project management is needed. And they don't know it because they haven't had any, well, why would they know it? If they never lived in a community before, they would just think community is mostly playing frisbee and having fabulous meals together and singing along and evening campfires, all the fun stuff, but they don't know it's a lot of also project management work. There needs to be effective project management for the community to succeed and not everybody either knows that there needs to be or knows how to do it. So there seems to be four kinds of people. So I'm going to write this on a little chart here. So I have one of these little things here. This person knows that you need good project management. They know you need it. They know. But they don't know how to do it themselves. That, that would be me. See, I'm kind of going, huh? I don't actually know how to manage a project well. I just recognize good management when I see it. Like I know good art, but I sure can't paint worth a darn. So, so some people know you need good project management in the community, but they don't know how to do it. And then there's other people who know you need it, and they do know how to do it. Then there's people who don't know you need it. So I'll put this in a, one of those circles with a slash. Project management, what the heck is that? Don't think we need it. What is it? Some people don't know, and they don't know they don't know that we need it. And some people um, know that some people think we need it, but they don't think we need it. So they might say no. So these people are saying, I know what project management is and we don't need it. And these people are saying, I don't know what it is and we don't need it. And these people are saying, oh, I know that we need it, but I don't know how to do it. And these people are saying, I know that we need it and I know how to do it. Welcome. Well, so what happens is we have conflict in groups that needn't have happened because it's like 
well, this can be prevented. If some people think there's no need for good project management and other things, people think there is a need for it, well, there's going to be a conflict there. And um, so I just want to mention this so that you'll know that I, who've been studying communities and find, trying to find out what helps them succeed and thrive and feel good, suggest that if people don't know that this is needed, that they uh, learn that it is because it's so important to have good management, ongoing management. Okay, so if you recall, I put a big circle in the middle of my three important things I think are important for community. So now I'm going to make the circle, you know, filled in. And what is the thing in the middle of these three important things? The thing that affects all of them and is affected by them. It's community governance. Governance. Community governance. And this could include the decision-making method. So I'll just write an EM there. Some decision-making methods do not include any governance processes. They just are, how do you make decisions? One is majority rule voting. Another is consensus, as many groups use. Uh, another might be a supermajority vote kind of thing. You know, it takes 85% of a vote. That's just decision making. There are two systems that I'm familiar with. One is holacracy, one is sociocracy that are governance and decision making. That is to say, they have a whole system for how you govern yourselves as a group, community, business, nonprofit, school, or some kind of organization. And they also have a built in decision making method that is congruent with the governance system. So, some people think, well, wait a sec, what's the difference? So I have this handout. I hope you got it. I hope you printed it out for yourself and downloaded it off the Google Hangout thing that Bob sent earlier. Difference between governance and decision making. Governance is what decisions are made. And decision making is a how are they made. So the what is how do we organize our work tasks and what's the flow of work? And what's the flow of information? Who can find out what, when, and how? Do we have an on-site um, web page that through a password all of us community members can get to and read the minutes of any committee at any whole group meeting and find out what they decided? Do we have a place where we can click and go and there's all of our policies and decisions? There's our dog policy and our community labor credit policy and our parking policy and our membership policy. We can just go look it up, meaning that information is transparent for all of us all the time, anytime. Do we have it also in hard copy, say in a three ring binder somewhere that we can go look at when we're all living in the community? Another thing that governance looks at is the flow of money. And another thing that governance does is uh, creating policies. Um, so. Organizing the flow of work, information, money, and what policies do we have and, and what are they about? Policies, of course, create limits, boundaries, and procedures for the stuff we do when we're doing work. Decision making is how do we make decisions? So we could very well have governance method A and decision making method B, or we could have governance method Z and decision making method X because they don't necessarily have to go with each other. Sometimes I'll ask community, how do you govern yourselves? And they say, with consensus. And what I think they're telling me is that they haven't given much thought to the fact that governance is different. So they think, well, we have meetings and we decide things. So I, would, so I live in a community where we have one great big twice a month meeting of everybody who wants to go which we call council meetings, and we decide big things like membership and annual budget and big policies, longer term, strategic, bigger things. We have 11 committees consisting of some of those same people and other people, and those committees have very specific concrete purposes, the membership committee, the visitors committee, the finance committee, the land use and site planning committee, the utilities committee, la la la, like that. And um, so our governance system consists here in my community of one great big circle that meets to decide things about bigger policies, longer term, more abstract, and smaller committees 
that's our governance. See, it's different than our decision making method. Okay, this is sort of overview things that I wanted to share with you, and I'm expecting there might be comments or questions. So I'll stop now so I can hear some of those from you. If anyone has any questions, they can uh, ask them now, and I'll ask them. Or well, it looks like maybe there are no questions. Well, um, what I'm wondering is, does anyone have a response such as, yes, I've observed this in communities, or, hey, this is boring, or why did you say this, or, yeah, this is a no-brainer, I already know it. I'd like to hear something from somebody, because otherwise I feel like I'm talking to the air. Is there anybody there? I have uh, a question from Steve. What does she see as a consequence of falling to the, of failing to make distinction between governance and decision-making procedures? The consequence, thank you, Steve. Um, now I know there's somebody there. Um, Sometimes there's no consequence that's that's negative. Um, however, I want to say these things in order to lay the groundwork for some other things I'm going to say about sociocracy, which is a, um, a governance and decision-making method that I advocate when a community can learn can learn it well and apply it correctly and completely. I have been observing four communities in North America who use sociocracy and are doing very well and they really like it and it's helping them just move so well. And I have observed four who, uh, who, are so, who have been really challenged by it, but it's not sociocracy they've been challenged by, it's they've been challenged by not understanding how to use it or apply it. And uh, I think it's because it's a little bit bigger to learn than just a simple decision-making method because you have to learn the governance part too, which is how does the flow of information, money, organizing work get organized so that we all know what we're all doing and we let each other do it. We give, we give consent to each other to just take care of things and we have recourse if we see something we don't like, but it's different from than in consensus. It doesn't let there be such extremes of either behavior or willingness to threaten to block, imply one might block, or actually block. A person can have objections to various proposals, but they're completely different objections are in their intention and their result than blocks, which are more like, <coughs> I'm stopping it. So, um, there may not be a negative consequence, but I wanted to suggest that there are these three important things. And why governance is so important is because if the governance and decision-making method works well, it has a huge implication and mutually beneficial effect on the project management. It is the structure through which the management occurs. If there's a whole lot of community glue, there needn't be such good governance because the community glue goes a long way to making people just figure out how to solve things in the moment because they've got so much trust for each other. But if there's not a lot of time or energy for community glue and there's too many new people coming in too fast before you can actually create all kinds of, you know, frisbee games and storytelling evenings and so on, then you really need good governance to help people understand what's going on and how they can affect change and how they can give their opinion and how they can affect the things that do affect them. If you have really good process and communication <laughs> skills, and you have, I'm hearing somebody's voice, what? Oh, if you have really good process and communication skills, which I hope you do, um, if the government's, the governance it is not working well, there'll be a lot of conflict, but you can deal with it because you've got these good skills. But if you have a whole lot of high community glue and really good governance process, you're not going to need to use your really good process and communication skills as a kind of a fallback for conflict because you just won't have that much that often. Do you see what I mean? These are like mutually reinforcing beneficial systems. 
ideally you'd have all these three in place plus a really effective governance. So really, Steve, why I wanted to bring this up was so that you could see the relationships between them. Uh, anyway, that's my opinion based on uh, my understanding of permaculture design, which is about mu mutually reinforcing beneficial systems on a landscape to increase yield of heat in the winter and coolness in the summer and water and plant fertility, soil fertility, and a place to live. In creating a community, designing it, and ongoingly managing it, if you have mutually beneficial systems that are mutually reinforcing, it reduces the amount of conflict and increases the yield of personal happiness. So that's a point that I wanted to make. Any comments before we go on? So Scott says um, that the hearing are loud and clear in Amherst. Steve has another question. Okay. Some people seem to feel that voting and consensus are incompatible. How would you address that perception? Oh boy, that's a good one. And it's one of my favorite topics. So thank you, Steve. I like this guy. He has questions. Um, okay. Consensus has two parts. One is the process. And what's the process? Well, we have an agenda. We have a facilitator. The agenda has it into planners. We've created different topics with different amounts of time that we're going to talk about it. And then we've got who's going to present it, who's going to be the person who presents that proposal or gives that report. And then we have um, all the things that we're going to do in the two hours or the three hours of our meeting. And we know this in advance. Plus, in advance, we have the proposals that have been emailed to us or physically posted somewhere. Okay? Our facilitator is trained and skilled and knows how to do it knows how to do all the things that are needed in consensus, which is to call on people in such a way that it's not a log jam, but we're doing one at a time as they raise their hand, getting on the stack. And the facilitator knows how to summarize where we are at and stop any negative or disruptive behaviors in a genteel, gracious way that is still effective. And we all know how to behave well in the meeting. Are you laughing and smiling now? <laughs> Not only that, the proposals are well created and they were done way in advance and they got to the agenda planners, you know, by the deadline time. They actually do address the issue and they cite previous agreements we might have if these would change. This is in my ideal world, right? Okay, that's the process. When we get to deciding, we decide with something called a decision rule. Decision rule, like a, like a ruler, which I just happen to have one right here. And a decision rule is the degree of uh, it's the amount of percent, it's the percent of the people present in the room in the meeting who are um, full community members who have a, a voice, who have a, cons a consensus right, a decision making right, the percentage needed to pass a proposal. Most of the time in consensus, as it's usually practiced in intentional communities, that's 100% of us who are in that meeting. We all have to agree. Unless somebody stands aside and we don't. And then that's okay. They can stand aside, but the, all the rest of us have to agree. Somebody cannot say, oh, I blocked that proposal. Because if they do, we can't pass the proposal. So we all have to uh, say yes, or at least I can live with it, which is ideally what you would do. Well, can that percentage be different than 100%? Yeah, it can. I call that 100% decision rule unanimity. And I call that way of using consensus consensus with unanimity. And I have recently become notorious in some community circles for having written this series of articles in Communities Magazine called Busting the Myth that consensus with unanimity is good for communities. Folks, I think it's actually harmful for communities. And I thought somebody needed to say that out loud at long last, so I did. And the arrows have been raining in from consensus trainers who think, oh, no, no, no. And a whole bunch of other people have been emailing me saying, oh, thank you for saying this. Finally, somebody said it out loud. Because a lot of people have had God awful experiences using consensus, but they thought they should because it's supposed to make everything better. And every consensus trainer and people in the community's movement will tell you that it creates harmony, trust, and connection. But in fact, I think that it often has as an unintended consequence lots of disharmony, conflict, de demoralization, discouragement, and people who don't go to meetings anymore. So, 
I'm interested in other kinds of decision rules, such as supermajority voting at the time that you get to the point of the decision. So you can do the consensus process, then, you're, then it comes time to decide and you can unhook unanimity or 100% from how you make the decision. You could use 90%, 95, 85, 80, 75, 70. You could use any percent that the group had proposed to itself that it uses and then agrees to use. How about that? So that's why I think voting and consensus are actually, oh, another question. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, why I think they're um, not exactly in opposition. But let me say something about the word voting. A whole lot of people think that voting means majority rule voting. It's the only kind of voting they ever did in grammar school, high school student government, college student government, and our national government and our state and municipal and local government. What, it, majority rule voting, that's the only thing they ever heard of. And they also misname it democracy, just as if all the other ways of shared decision-making are not also democracy. OK, so when, when you say, how is consensus different than voting, consensus is different from majority rule voting in a whole lot of ways. One is, in majority rule voting, you can have tyranny of the majority. And in consensus with unanimity, you can have tyranny of the what? Of the minority. Yeah. And does, do groups ever have that? Oh, yeah. So I hope that that's um, helpful. And I will now step off my soapbox and quit pontificating about that. What's that other question? Well, the other question is kind of a step back. How should a newly formed group educate itself about the different forms of governance when it hasn't yet decided on a model. This is from Gordon from Community Housing Initiative. OK. Um, I would say the first place to start is Wikipedia. And you can read about consensus, majority rule voting. Don't use that. Um, holacracy and sociocracy. You can learn about the in-street method by Googling in-street co-housing solution-oriented meetings, and you'll see an article that I put in my newsletter online. It's a free newsletter. You can just go and read it. I can also send to anyone who's interested an article about how in-street co-housing works, their, co their consensus method. It's, it's a modification of consensus decision-making, which I like very much and highly recommend for groups who wish to continue using consensus. Um, then there's various websites where you can learn about sociocracy. If you Google the sociocracy consulting group, you'll get sociocracyconsulting.com. If you click on resources, you'll get videos. If you go down four videos, you'll get a video of the people at Lost Valley Educational Center, a community in Oregon, with different members talking about how much more they like sociocracy than consensus, which they had used for 22 years. And they switched over to sociocracy, and oh my gosh, they like it so much. Um, I also have a handout, which I can send to Bob, and he can send to you, about resources on learning about sociocracy. If you're interested in holacracy, you can go to the holacracy1, O-N-E, holacracy1 website, where there are free one-hour webinars that are already online. You can watch them anytime, trying, uh, not trying, but you know, giving you an overview of Holacracy. You can take a one-hour free webinar on Holacracy. I'm one of the few people that I know who, who is a consensus trainer, retired, I don't teach it anymore, and a sociocracy trainer, and I've studied Holacracy. So I really understand the differences and similarities between the three of them. The thing about Holacracy that I love, it well, I won't say what it is, but I love it. And it's so expensive to learn, I don't recommend it to communities. You can also read the book, We the People, about sociocracy. And I can send you my handout, which is five pages designed to be simple, straightforward language, explaining things so people in a community can think, how would this work in a community? So if you're interested in that, let Bob know, and I'll send it. Or maybe I'll send it to Bob anyway. And, I'll just send it out. So I hope that's helpful. 
I'd like to move on to the next thing, if I may. We've got a handout called Things That Do and Don't Work Well in Co-Housing Governance. See this little list? It's actually two pages. And I hope that you got it off of the clickable link that Bob sent you there where you can, you know, download it as a PDF and then open it up and read it. What it is, is there was a community that hired me recently to be a consultant to them. And I listened to what they told me in their pre-consultant telephone call. And I thought, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of things that they are making assumptions about that seem hurtful to their happiness and well-being. They don't know better because they haven't done this before. I, I can't blame them. How would they know? So I made this little list, like, the, you know, things that work well, things that don't work well, cause you to go run screaming from the room. And so um, I hope that you'll have a chance to look at that because it goes over some of what we have already talked about. And sometimes people in a community think the community is supposed to serve them and it's like their parent and they're the children and they're supposed to receive services from the community and, and the community will take care of them. And it's not even a consciously stated thing. It's just like an unconscious assumption. Whereas other people in the same group might have the unconscious assumption that the community is like the child, an organism, a, a tender, small creature that they, the community members, the parents need to nurture, tend, take care of, do good project management for, and help that baby grow up. And now I am of the latter opinion. I think that a community is like a child and it's members are its parents, but when people have different underlying assumptions like this, they can have conflict in the group. Some people want to be taken care of and other people want to take care of the community and make sure that it has what it needs. Like a child growing up, does it have enough money? Does it need the, the roads need to be fixed? Does the roof need to be fixed? Do we have some conflict in this area? Do we need to address that and see how we can resolve it? So in my opinion, communities need tending just like children need raising and so on and so on. So I hope you'll get to read that. Then I want you to check out this handout that says structural conflict. About 13 years ago, I made up the term structural conflict. I just made it up, put it in a book. And now this term is being used around the country by people in communities. And what it means is it's the kind of conflict that can happen when the group, which is well-meaning folks that perhaps and probably didn't live in, live in community before, if they don't know certain things that they should put in place, certain important uh, structures or processes or activities, they don't know, they don't know because they never did it before. And the lack of that important structure causes a terrible conflict, but it's hard to tell because it looks like interpersonal conflict. It looks like uh, Bob there is behaving like a jerk and I'm behaving like an immature fool and Bob and I are duking it out and having verbal battles and stuff. Yeah, there's me and Bob demonstrating to you this, this can happen. Does this ever happen in a group? Oh, never. And well, what it is is because we don't have clear agreements in writing. We thought we'd just remember everything. Or what's really happening is we have two completely different opinions partly conscious and partly subconscious in our group about what our community is for. What is our purpose? What are we here to do? Or, or here's another one. Um, we have a decision-making process, but half of us or 90% or, or of us never got trained in it, don't know how to do it. And we're sort of stumbling around and then we're having fights, not only about other things, but fights about how do we do this decision-making process. No, you're supposed to do it like this. Oh, you're supposed to do it like that. This, that, this, that. We have all these fights. All it would take is if we all got trained in the same method and then made ourselves a proposal to use method da 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 da, passed the proposal or modified it, agreed on it, and now we have a policy, a document. Now we can be on the same page with our decision-making method. What else? We need a clear and thorough membership process unless we cannot for co-housing we cannot, but we can try to encourage people who understand co-housing, understand community, and understand that co-housing does not bend itself into a pretzel to serve me, my needs, and my entitlement interests, because I want the community to give me what I want it to give me. Rather, when you join community, it's kind of like, how can we serve? How can we help? 
Okay. Um, so I just want you to check out this this um, handout. Some of the things that I didn't mention are a shared vision, mission, and aim, fair and participatory decision-making process. We've all been trained in it. The new oncoming people get trained in it before they have full decision-making rights. That is to say, if it's consensus, they can't block a proposal until they've been trained in how consensus works. If it's sociocracy, they cannot object to a proposal until they've been trained. Did you put up a sign that said question? Another question. Okay. Go ahead. It's, it's also from Steve. What are the key distinguishing characteristics between structural and personal conflict? How can you be certain it's one or the other or disentangle the components when both conflict types seem to be present in a given situation? Well, you're absolutely right. They'll both be there because when there's the stress of a very important missing structure that the well-meaning community founders did not put in place yet because they didn't know they should, then you've got people upset. And when people are upset, they're going to be behaving at their worst, not their best. And then you do have interpersonal conflict on top of it. So there's one kind of remedy or resolution or way to address how people communicate with each other, which can intensify conflict. So once again, I highly recommend learning nonviolent communication as a communication tool. Another thing you can do is resolve conflicts as best you can with restorative circles, a process I highly recommend. Both of these things, like consensus and like sociocracy, take learning. A group has to learn how to do it. A lot of people who are joining a co-housing community are not joining the community in as committed a way as people who join other kinds of communities or some other kinds of communities. So they might think, look, I'm really busy. I have to take the kids to soccer practice. I, I am learning uh, such a rather thing that I go take lessons in at night, plus I work full time. Not only do I work full time, but I volunteer at my church and I just don't have time for all this community stuff. So like, don't ask me to do too much. I just want to live here. You ever run into that kind of viewpoint? Uh, as if the community exists to give you cool things like a common house and shared meals three to four nights a week and all kinds of wonderful services. And all you have to do is not lift the finger and you're just going to get it all. Al contraire, it takes people working to provide all that. Um, Bob, was that an indication of another question? You just made a gesture. Uh, actually, there is. Well, actually, there's a brief thing. I was excited about the common house. That's all. We don't have ours quite yet. Oh, well, you will. Um, Linda asks, uh, what is the success rate of co-housing communities in the U.S.? 66% of forming communities become existing according to Chuck Durrett a couple of years ago. This is better statistics than non-co-housing communities, which is about, no wait, I've got it backwards. 33% of the forming groups actually get built and people move into them, according to Chuck. And 66% fail in lots of conflict and sometimes losing your shirt. See this shirt? You could lose it. Um, in uh, forming co-housing groups. My own statistics, which are armchair guesses is that it's 90% not in co-housing, but in all kinds other than co-housing. 10% um, succeed, 90% fail, and lots of conflict and heartbreak. And co-housing does better, but not ideal. Ideally, 100%, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to structural conflict. Um, clear agreements in writing, help each other stay accountable to the group agreements, and uh, learn good communication and process skills. Learn the skills that you need to start a community. Left brain skills, good project management, bookkeeping, accounting, legal documents, loans and finances and all that stuff. Um, right brain skills, communicating from the heart, transparent, honest, effective, goodwill communication. Learning NBC, learning restorative circles, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole point is 
the kinds of conflict that can happen that are preventable are if the group puts these things in place in the beginning. What I have to add to this list because one of the things that can go wrong is that the early members of a co-housing community learn a lot of really effective, helpful things about how you do community and how you develop a co-housing community. And they don't train the new people who come in their group. The new people just come in and they sort of think of it like, oh, it's like throwing the baby in the swimming pool. The baby will learn how to swim just by swimming. And you don't even have to teach the baby to swim. The baby will just swim. And so the baby's just puttering around the pool and going, see, the baby swim in the swimming pools. But it doesn't really work when you throw baby new community members into the pool of your group because they don't necessarily learn your culture, your traditions, what you take as a basic a priori assumption about your group and about community and about what you're doing. Because you're so busy doing all that other stuff, it didn't occur that you have to train them, teach them, share with them, give them a decision log, a little notebook that's their own that has every single bylaws and articles of incorporation in and all of our agreements and decisions in it, like listed by topic and listed by um, date. And so that, so that they're not clueless because what happens when the early members leave because they can't afford it anymore, or they had to move to New Hampshire and take care of their mom, or they had to move to California because, oh, I don't know, they got discovered by Hollywood or something. And, and then a bunch of new people come in and floods of new people come in and various of the older members are still there, but now they're surrounded by newer people who are a greater percentage. And the older people are saying, well, our agreement is to do blah, blah, blah. And the newer people are going, yeah, well, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I wasn't here when you decided that and I didn't agree to that. If you ever have that attitude, that is a big shame. But the point is, man, you not you need to share the culture. I don't mean you, anybody listening here. I mean groups that are starting new communities. They need to share their traditions, their culture, their values, their visions, their goals, their agreements, their documents, their policies, so that those new people become acclimated, uh, encultured, socialized to the way the group is. Otherwise, you can have this really ridiculous and awful, heartbreaking situation that nobody likes, which is where this small island of original members are trying to tell these 90% of people who came later, 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 and later, this is how we do things. And the 90% says, oh, yeah, well, I don't want to. Why should we? So then, so the whole deal is, okay, new person, if you don't want to do it that way, we have a governance process which we've adopted and if you've joined our group you've joined our governance process and you've joined all the agreements we've already made if you want to change one use our governance process to change it if we're using consensus make a proposal in the correct committee who will bring the proposal to that committee or the whole group if we're using sociocracy make a proposal in the circle that you're in or go to the circle and say may i give this proposal so we can change la 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 about the community there's a completely excellent perfect way which is to use the governance the group already has but sometimes people do what i call governance drift so here we have governance where's my fabulous little chart here we have our governance method and we just kind of go la 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 and we float away from it we don't use it and when somebody says Oh, could we please use the governance that we had before that we decided upon, which is where if you blah, blah, and then they say some agreement the group has, somebody says, oh, why can't you be more flexible? Or they say, what is this bureaucratic crap? Let's just do what we want to. Or somebody says, uh, why are you so rigid? And what this is doing essentially is using shame and humiliation tactics to browbeat people into shutting the heck up so that the community drifts away from its own agreements and governance and finally months years later it's kind of in a mess because it didn't just adhere to what it agreed to or change what it agreed to through some reasonable rational clear and transparent process such as using the governance the group already had agreed to this can drive groups crazy don't let it happen to you Okay. Before we go to the next thing, are there any comments, questions, or rotten tomatoes you want to throw at your computer screen? Okay, from Steve, say more about accountability. What okay. leverage does community have really to help 
ensure that members adhere to agreements and follow through with commitments? How do you keep from depending entirely on the strength of the social glue? Well, that's a good question. Steve, have you lived in community a long, long time? <laughs> it sounds like a really experienced person here. <laughs> okay. Um, I have two handouts, which I'll send to Bob, if he can send them to you. One is called Helping People Stay Accountable to Agreements. And the other one is called a Graduated Series of Consequences. Consequences? How horrible. We won't need consequences because when we live in community, everyone will always keep their agreements all the time. And we will have wonderful, well-behaved children in fabulous group meetings where we all behave wonderfully and we're all courteous and gracious. And we'll have wonderful meals and we'll gather in the meadow to play frisbee and sing kumbaya and we'll all ascend into a paradisical state. Yeah, right. People break agreements all the time in communities and they get away with it unless we say, oh, I'm sorry, no, please keep the agreement. Here's the agreement again. Do you need some assistance? Can we help you? Gracious, courteous ways to help encourage and remind each other to keep our agreements. And this can be things like where do we park or not park, uh, dog policy things. Whoa, that one's controversial. Dog policy things, cat policy things, less controversial but still controversial. Um, how children do and don't behave, policy things. Quiet hours, how do we, what are our standards of cleanliness in the common house and things like that. Um, or it can be paying. Do we pay our dues and fees? We hope we do. Uh, do we contribute to work parties? Do we agree to do certain uh, tasks in a committee that we're in and then we don't do them or we do do them? We're all downstream from each other when we live in community. What I do affects you and you and you and you because you're downstream from me. And what you do affects me because I'm downstream from you and we're all downstream. You know what I mean? When one does not live in community or never has before, this is not necessarily obvious. When you live in community for a few years, it's real obvious. So one of the things Steve said is besides uh, the social fabric, what keeps people doing what they should, and I would say the community eyeball. See this eyeball? This eyeball is looking at you. Did you ever see the movie with Robert De Niro called Meet the, Meet the In-Laws or something like that? He had a son-in-law that he didn't like, so he'd say, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. And he had a Robert De Niro voice. I'm looking at you. So if we're all looking at you um, in community, we're much less likely to uh, violate our agreements about parking or quiet hours or paying dues and fees or um, violating some agreements about do we make a messy front porch or not? Uh, do, do we leave dangerous things where somebody can step on them or do we not? Do we not let our dog go do this and that and that over in your yard? Um, when nobody says anything about it, and nobody knows that Reginald violated agreements A, B, C, and D, Reginald keeps on violating them. But if we all know that he did, he stops. I think because the basic human need to be liked, respected, included, and be thought well of by others. We want to be valued and respected by others. So we'll clean up our acts. If we're living at home with our mom and dad and we're 23, and our mom and dad tells us to do a thing, we can go, oh, dad, oh, mom. If we're living with our partner in a little apartment and that other person, our love partner says, would you please not do X and instead do Y? We can go, oh, yeah, that's your issue. But when we're in community and the whole group knows that we're doing X or Y, but we're not supposed to be doing that or we're supposed to be doing something, but we're failing to do it, then um, we should sharpen up right now. So I am all in favor of uh, using the community I, which is a non-shame, non-blame way of letting people know that we know that there's a difficulty here. We care about them. We're interested. We're concerned. Can I help you? Do you need any help? And we can train each other to do the final piece of growing up that our parents might not have done. We have to help each other complete the job to become sort of like responsible, effective citizens of our community.
Okay, I want to do one last thing before uh, we go. We've got just five minutes, or <gasps> less than five. My clock is too slow. Uh, here's a thing that I hope you got on the handouts. Um, how, how communities learn and implement sociocracy. I mentioned earlier that I'm really a fan of sociocracy. I absolutely adore it, and now I teach it also. And I'm on the trail to find out what works well in learning how to do it and what seems to make people cuckoo. And then they drive each other cuckoo, and then they think, oh, I hate the sociocracy thing. No need to do that if you can learn some things. What, one thing that helps very much is that every single person learns how to do it. Not just some, but everybody. And they have a study group, or they study it maybe once a week on some evening, or maybe two, two times a month. Before move-in, maybe this is done online, on something like a Google Hangout. And they learn each of the parts. They learn that it is a governance method, a decision-making method, and a set of feedback loops. They learn there's five processes consent decision-making, proposal forming, looking at implemented proposals later to see how they're working and do we need to change it, modify it, or throw it out. How to select people for roles and how to give people role improvement feedback. I'm using some new terms that sociocracy doesn't use that I use for intentional communities. Um, that they have access to somebody online in a webinar or a Skype call or something who can help when they've got questions or issues. Um, or challenges. Um, teaching the new people who join the group that we use sociocracy and how we use it so that we don't just throw the baby in the bathwater or the swimming pool and think they're going to swim. The four communities that I see that are doing well, they had a consultant who trained them in a weekend workshop or longer than a weekend and then came there and helped them do it and helped facilitate meetings, taught them how to facilitate and serve as a consultant for a while. They also had a study group. They also continuously trained and taught themselves. They, all, they taught their new members as soon as the new members got in. The ones who were having good challenges, they didn't do this. They didn't train new members. They didn't train their existing members. They didn't have any kind of ongoing help so they could ask questions. Um, the ones that succeeded drew a chart with the circles and double links, and everybody had a copy of the chart. And they all knew who was the operations leader and who was the elected representative. The ones who had terrible challenges, they did not draw, draw a chart. And when I asked them, oh, can you tell me about your circles? Could you draw me a chart? They couldn't do it. They didn't know. Or two different people would draw two different charts and go, well, what about land use? Is land use the same thing as utility? No, no, that's, they just didn't know. Lastly. They thought maybe an operations leader, an elected representative, could be the same person. But you can't be sending oxygenated blood out through your arteries and then expected non-oxygenated blood to be coming back the other way. You need both arteries and veins. You need both elected representatives and operational leaders. So the ones that are doing well with sociocracy actually are using it. They learned how they're implementing it for real, for sure. They have ongoing encouraging help. They develop their understanding of it ongoingly and they teach their new members and they draw the circles chart. The ones that are challenged and frustrated and having difficulty, they don't do those things. Okay, I guess that's everything. I'm willing to stay on a few wow. more minutes if anybody wants to, to talk about any of that stuff. Well, actually, one of the questions that came through was, is introduce the basic structure of sociocracy, but it seems like that would be a, a longer question than we can get to. That's a two-day workshop. <laughs> Although I'll send you my, uh, over, I'll send my <laughs> overview handout. Bob, I'll send you the overview handout. You can send it out to people. Okay, and the only other one, which could, could get to be a little bit long, too, but let me just read it, it is... Okay. One of the strengths of consensus-based community governance is the focus it brings on hearing each other, paying attention, reaching deeper understanding of one another's perspectives. Do we ri risk losing that by turning to other methods of that of shortcut? No, not at all. Fortunately, not at all. These values and practices and deeply important things that the person likes about consensus 
uh, are built into sociocracy because the guy who created sociocracy, a Dutch engineer, went to went to high school grammar school and high school and most famous Quaker um, private school in, in Europe in those days and was trained in the Quaker way of including everybody and thinking about the well-being of everybody. He was like steeped in that his whole childhood and his whole young adulthood. Then he went off to engineering school and became an electronic engineer, I mean electric engineer, and he learned about feedback and evaluation and feedback loops and being precise and clear. So sociocracy has three parents. The mom is consensus and the Quaker-based tradition of caring for everybody and equivalence of voice. The dad is um, is uh, engineering. Whoa! It's precise. It's clear. It's helpful. It's easy to learn because it's so clear. And you have feedback loops, which is a good thing. Uh oh, everybody just vanished. Well, are you still You're there? You're still there. Okay. I'm still here. We're both still here. We're both still here. Okay. Um, and the, the third parent, what? Three parents? Yes. The third parent is um, systems from chaos theory, self organizing systems. All throughout Mother Nature, planets, solar systems, tissues, organelles, <laughs> protoplasm, you name it, a chaotic bleh will self organize. And there's principles to it, and you can read this by various highfalutin scientists with Nobel Prizes, and that out of it comes chaos theory, and out of chaos theory comes systems thinking and self-organizing systems. So once again, what are the three parents of sociocracy? Quaker-based consensus, engineering feedback loops, and self-organizing systems from nature. How can you go wrong? Well, this has been a really awesome, sh awesome show. Thank you, Diana. This is great. We You're know welcome. it is part one. There have been part two sometime in the future. We don't have a date for that yet, but we really appreciate you making this wonderful presentation this evening. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Belfast Housing and Eco Village, for putting this show on. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>